All right, well, last time we were struggling with um, the nature of social explanation and the nature of psychological explanation. And those of you who are cognitive science students will recognize this as essentially the foundations of cognitive science. And the argument that I have been presenting really since the beginning of the course is that effectively uh, there are uh, two real levels. Uh, there is the level of intentionality, conscious and unconscious, uh, including what I call a background as part of the level of intentionality. And of course, there are lots of different levels within that level. One of the things we haven't talked about is collective or social intentionality, where you're engaged in an activity as part of a group, such as playing in an orchestra or, uh, or uh, playing on a team in a sport. And then in addition to that, of course, the whole thing is grounded in the neurobiology. It's grounded in the brain. And once again, there are lots of different levels of explanation ranging all the way from the synapse uh, and the axons and dendrites to the details of the microanatomy of the neuron, ranging all the way up to large organs within the brain, such as the thalamus or the hippocampus. And we now know a whole lot more about that stuff than we used to know, but we've got a long way to go. We still don't know an awful lot. I think the textbooks probably still cite HM as their standard on uh, memory. Uh, if you haven't suffered from HM, you will. Uh, the poor guy died recently. Let me tell you his story. It's, this is kind of a digression, but it's sort of interesting. Uh, HM uh, suffered from terrible uh, epileptic fits, uh, and they couldn't cure him by standard therapeutic techniques. So they did a radical thing. They removed uh, the hippocampus. In fact, they did it on both sides. Uh, they, the bilateral uh, removal of the hippocampus. There's probably a name, hippocampusectomy or something like that, that I don't know. Anyway, what is the hippocampus, you ask? Well, the hippocampus is a banana-shaped job about the size of your little finger, and it's stuck about half an inch. I'm using technical terms here, uh, about in, inside your ear. So they took out both hippocampi. That's the plural all of you classical scholars recognize. Uh, they took out both hippocampi, and they did cure the epilepsy, but the, uh, uh, the effect, side effects were pretty catastrophic uh, because HM couldn't lay down any new memories. He could remember things that happened to him a long time ago, uh, but he could not uh, remember. He couldn't uh, lay down any memories of recent events. Uh, and the, so the conclusion that people drew, and it's not unreasonable, is I suppose, well, the hippocampus plays a special role in laying down long-term memories. Now, it turns out uh, there are, the whole uh, story is much more complicated than that. And any qualified neurosurgeon, will, well, neuroscientist will tell you, never believe the neurosurgeons, the guys who actually stab the brain. They said they just removed the hippocampus. But Larry Squire, who's a very good guy on brains, I used to work for the VA. I don't know who Larry works for now. But he's terrific on memory. And he did a study of the literature. And it turns out they didn't just take out the hippocampus, they took out a whole lot of the surrounding tissue because they're there with their dumb knives stabbing away. I don't want to think about it, it's too awful. Anyway, uh, so we're never quite sure what, uh, what to make of these cases. And uh, of course, the all-time favorite case is Phineas Gage. How did I get started on this? I don't want to tell you about Phineas Gage, but I'll tell you just uh, a, a sentence or two. Phineas Gage was a guy who worked on a railroad in the 19th century. And there was an explosion, and a bar, a steel bar, went clean through his head. Now, miraculously, he lived. He didn't die. But when, he, when they pulled the bar out and the guy survived, his whole personality was changed. He was, before, he'd been hardworking, responsible, easy to get on with, the ideal citizen. Uh, and afterwards, he was grumpy, unreliable, nasty, brutish, and I don't know if he was short or not. But anyhow, uh, not a nice guy to be around. The store, and Phineas Gage, I mean, what does this prove? Well, it proves the brain has something to do with your personality, uh, as if anybody had any doubts about that. 
Uh, anyway, so there is a lot of interesting uh, brain uh, research, and really we do know a lot more than we used to know. And I, I have not been active in this field for some time because I've been working on a whole lot of other stuff, but it is worth keeping a close track of it. I wrote an article, which I think is in the collected readings, on consciousness for the annual review of neuroscience. And there is a lot of work on consciousness, and some of it's actually pretty good. Okay, now we are now discussing uh, the nature of explanation in cognitive science, and I have argued that no empirical sense can be given to the idea that in addition uh, uh, to consciousness and sort of common sense unconsciousness uh, where you have things that you're not thinking about at the moment and neurobiology that there is a special level of what I call the deep unconscious of unconscious mental processes that are so abstract so deeply embedded that they're not even the kind of thing that you could become conscious of. You couldn't become conscious of all of the computational processes, or indeed any of the computational processes, that enable you to see, for example, that enable you to look around the room and identify people, chairs, lights, windows, etc. Uh, and I've argued that nobody's attached a clear sense to that, that there is no such thing as a deep unconscious. There's a perfectly legitimate notion of the unconscious uh, where we have to cite all kinds of unconscious mental phenomena uh, to explain obvious forms of behavior. And I, uh, Freud's examples are as good as any. Uh, Freud gives the example of, of, uh, of hypnotism whereby we can observe the person uh, in the post-hypnotic condition. That is, we give them, when they're under hypnosis, we give them a suggestion, we tell them to do something, and they come out of the hypnosis, and then they do the thing they were told to do, though they always invent some reason. A sort of example that Freud, I'll give you a slightly different example uh, from the one that he actually used, but the kind of example is you tell them, uh, uh, when I say the word psychology, you're going to crawl around on the floor. Uh, okay, so uh, in the course of the discussion after the hypnosis, uh, the, the hypnotist says something like, well, there's a lot of hypnosis going on in psychology nowadays. And suddenly the guy says, fascinating floor in this room, and then he gets down on all fours and starts crawling around on the floor. Now the interesting thing is the guy always has an explanation. He says things like, you know, since the budget crisis in the state of California, they haven't been keeping these floors up the way they did when I was a boy. Uh, they don't sweep them as much as they used to. And furthermore, uh, my broker wants us to get into Armstrong tile as an investment, and these look like Armstrong uh, tiles to me. Uh, so then he has, he, it, the guy always has some elaborate explanation for why he's crawling around on the floor. We know that's not the real reason. Now, I think that that notion of the unconscious is perfectly legitimate, uh, and it is, uh, indeed, I think it's essential. And there are lots of other recent, more recent psychological experiments about priming and uh, all sorts of cases where people are mistaken in identifying their own motivations. And we're pretty clear in the experimental situation. Two authors you should look at are Nisbet and Wilson, who've done a lot of stuff on this. Okay, so you need a notion of the unconscious, you need the notion of the conscious, you need the notion of neurobiology. The question is, is there another notion of the deep unconscious, which are computational processes that are so deep and so abstract, they're not even the kind of thing you could become conscious of. And I gave you an argument that says, no, that's incoherent. Why? Because the notion of intentionality always implies an aspect. Representation is always under some aspect or other. And there's no way you can capture the notion of an aspect in the deep unconscious, where the guy, and I put this, I introduce a piece of harmless jargon here. I say, every intentional state has to have an aspectual shape. There's a difference between wanting water and wanting H2O, even though water is H2O. Why? Because a guy might not know that water was H2O. So he might be thirsty for water, he might admit to that, but deny that he was thirsty for H2O. Every mental state with intentional content must have an aspectual shape. 
But when the state is unconscious then and there, what, there is no aspectual shape present. There's just a neurobiological structure. What fact about the neurobiology makes it have one aspectual shape rather than another? And I say the only way you can answer that is to think of the neurobiology as giving you a capacity to produce the mental state in a conscious form. So the notion of the unconscious is parasitic on the notion of, the, of consciousness, and that's because we have a notion of an unconscious mental state only as the kind of thing that could be conscious. Now, Freud observed that. There was no question in the Freudian uh, canon, in, in, uh, in Freud's works, that he thought of unconscious uh, mental states as the kind of thing that you can bring to consciousness. Indeed, that's what you pay uh, the psychoanalyst to help you do. And after all these years of analysis, you're supposed to bring your, you're supposed to dredge up the unconscious and bring it to consciousness. Why? As long as it's unconscious, you don't have any control over it. It controls you. When you bring it to consciousness, you can control it. Now, if I understood intellectual history a bit better than I do, I would uh, understand why Freud, first of all, was so ascendant for so long and why he has rather suddenly dropped out of fashion. Uh, my parents' generation was much impressed uh, by Freud. Uh, I, my generation was already uh, more doubtful about Freud, though there were a lot of Freudians running around the woods even then. My mother was a medical doctor, and she, was, she really took Freud very seriously. So uh, whenever I used to slug my little brother, what are little brothers for, for God's sake, if you can't slug them? Whenever I slug Billy Boy, my punishment was I had to read a chapter on sibling rivalry in a book written by friends of my parents, this dreadful book, Backwin and Backwin, Principles of Child Psychology. It's probably on Google somewhere. I hope to burn all the copies. Uh, anyway, there is a boring chapter on sibling rivalry. I couldn't even pronounce it when I was eight years old. But every time I slug Billy Boy, I had to read this dumb chapter. Anyway, that was so that shows you how seriously that generation took uh, Freudian psychology, but I think it's gone out of fashion. I, I think, I don't know. I'm, I, I, do you have? I, do you personally get psychoanalyzed, or have friends who get psychoanalyzed? I think Berkeley, you see, is full of Freudian analysts. But as far as I can tell, they're a bit like the Chinese laundry that takes in other Chinese laundry. They psychoanalyze each other, uh, and I don't know how many clients they have left. Uh, so they are defensive. I lectured to the. Uh, Psychoanalytic Society of San Francisco, um, and I, I talked about the nature of psychological explanation, and it struck me, for a bunch of shrinks, they're pretty defensive about their uh, professional operations. They want to know, well, what do you really feel about psy psychoanalysis? Do you really believe in it? Uh, so I told them another story. I mean, what can you do? You just give anecdotes. Uh, <clears throat> among my uh, Parents, when I was a child, among my parents' friends was a, a psychoanalyst who'd actually been trained by Freud himself. Dr. Leo Tepley escaped from Vienna and had a psychoanalytic practice in Denver. And Leo was, he hung around the house and I got to know this guy, he seemed a nice enough guy. But he was always asking me dumb questions. Once when my father went on a business trip, we all went down to Union Station. People used to do that. They don't do it anymore. They don't, nobody goes to the airport with you. But they all went down to Union Station in Denver to see my dad off on the train. And Leo took me one side and said in a heavy Viennese accent, are you glad your father is going away? <laughs> I was about five years old, you see. Uh, and I, you know, frankly, no, I wasn't glad my dad was going away. But Leo obviously had an agenda that at the age of five I did not understand. Uh, I, Leo had the agenda that at the age of five you must want to be raping your mother. That's what any good chi five-year-old child wants to do. Now, I have to confess, at the age of five, I had other things on my mind. <laughs> But well, anyway, I don't know how we got off onto this. What I'm, I, what I, what I'm really what I'm trying to tell you uh, is that there are fashions in the study of the mind, 
And the Freudian, a, a, a Freudian psychoanalysis had an enormous influence for a long period of time. Uh, and it would be interesting to know what was the source of its influence. It even got into literary theory, for example. A whole lot of people, Edmund Wilson, who was a pretty good critic, thought, well, we've got to give psychoanalytic interpretations. And he did a rather dumb psychoanalytic interpretation of Henry James, which, to his credit, he later took back. He thought it was a dumb reading. Uh, of, of Henry James. Uh, but in any case, uh, Freud was very influential for a long time, and now I think it has gone out of fashion. Um, and it may have been the feminists who, who uh, uh, partly discredited Freud, because he had a very uh, negative attitude about women. What on earth do women want? Well, that's a good question, uh, but he didn't get a, a, a satisfactory answer to it. Uh, OK, so we're, uh, we are we, we're in a situation, I am arguing, where we have no clear notion of the deep unconscious, where there's no empirical notion, no scientific validity to the idea that our behavior is explained by a whole lot of unconscious mental processes, which are not even the kind of thing you could become conscious of because they are all computational. Uh, they are a whole lot of zeros and ones, millions of them flashing through your brain, and that's really what explains your ability to learn a language or your ability to see objects around you. Now, I've argued that there is uh, no sense to that, uh, that you've got to substitute for that the what I call the shallow unconscious, a common sense notion of the unconscious, and consciousness and neurobiology. Now, how then do you explain the appearance of intelligent processing in unconscious behavior? And I offered an explanation for that. I said, you have to do something which is analogous uh, to Darwin's inversion of the traditional explanatory apparatus. Uh, you have to do a kind of uh, inversion of the conditional. And you remember, I'm going to go through this slowly now, but I want to remind you. You remember I said the Darwinian revolution was a deeper revolution than a lot of people realized because it didn't dis discover a new explanation. It discovered a new form of explanation. So instead of saying the leaf turns toward the sun, the plant turns its leaf toward the sun because it wants to survive or in order to survive, you substitute two levels. You say, the plant turns its leaf toward the sun for purely mechanical reasons. It secretes the, the growth hormone auxin. But plants that do that are more likely to survive than plants that don't. So survival still functions, but the explanation got inverted. It's not, now survival is not the goal, because there isn't any goal. It's just something that happens. But survival is essential, however, to the long-term survival of the species. The survival of the individual plant is essential to the long-term survival of the species. So if you take the historical view, survival still functions in the explanation, but it's no longer the goal. It is something that happens. Now, I want to use that same type of inversion on a lot of the apparently uh, plausible uh, cognitive science explanations of what look like unconscious mental processes. And the example I started to explain to you, but I want to complete now, is the vestibular ocular reflex. The vestibular ocular reflex plays a crucial role in vision because it stabilizes the retinal image. If you didn't have a VOR, you'd have a hell of a time uh, being able to see when you're in a moving car or walking or running. Uh, it's interesting to look at birds. Birds, for the most part, owls, for example, don't have a VOR. What they have to do is move their head around. So you see the bird sitting on the telephone wire moving its head around because uh, it doesn't have it, uh, the VOR enables you to keep your head still and, and uh, still keep focused on an object because the eyeball will move inside. Uh, the head. So if you were an owl driving a car, if you could train your owl to drive a car, the owl would have to do a whole lot of this kind of head movement in order to keep its eye on the road. You don't. The VOR takes over. Now there's a very deep philosophical mistake we make, and I want to state it explicitly. It's this. If the brain has a meaningful input, and it has a meaningful output, 
then the processes in between must be meaningful as well. And I think in general that's a mistake. There are a lot of processes that are just straightforward brain processes. The brain just does it. And the beauty of the VOR is we know how the brain does it. Uh, you don't have to think con unconsciously, I've got to move my eyeball equal and opposite to the movement of my head in order to stabilize the retinal image. The, the ma machinery, the sheer mechanical uh, devices of uh, the inner ear and the brain, the cerebellum in particular, take over. So there's a reflex whereby you continue to focus on the object you had your eyes on, even though your head is moving. And you can try this just right now. Shake your head up and down or look right and left, and you will find your eyes remain focused on whatever you were focusing on. Now, what I'm arguing is there's no intentional content to the process by which the brain takes in uh, the meaningful uh, thought, or the meaningful experience. I'm looking at this object uh, to the output I remain looking at this object even though my head has moved. In between, though both of those are meaningful. You're looking at something and you keep looking at it. But the processes in between are not meaningful. The processes in between have no intentional content. They're strictly mechanical. I, and I, I meant, I, you know, I won't go into the details, but what happens is the, the inner ear, your old friend, uh, the inner ear, I has these sensors that detect the uh, movement of your head. They transmit that message uh, to the cerebellum, and, the, and that goes over, over the eighth cranial nerve, and the cerebellum controls the reflex movement of the eye. So you have a straightforward reflex with no intentional content. And now what we've done is we've inverted the e explanation in a way that's analogous to Freud. The original explanation was, you follow the rule of the vestibular ocular reflex in order to stabilize the retinal image. Remember the rule is move your head equal and move your eyeball equal and opposite to the movement of your head. You follow that rule in order to stabilize the retinal image. What we substitute for it are two levels. The one level says you don't follow any rule at all. Uh, there is just a mechanical set of connections in the brain whereby this happens. It's just something that happens when you move your head. But here comes uh, the other level. Organisms that do that, humans that do that, will be able to see better than humans that don't. So you don't fo follow the rule in order to stabilize the retinal image. The retinal image just gets stabilized. But now, Organisms that have that type of stability of the retinal image see better than organisms that don't. So what I've done is, an, an, on the apparently uh, intentionalistic, cognitivist explanation of the vestibular ocular reflex, I have substituted two other levels analogous to the Darwinian inversion of the conditional. So instead of saying, we do this in order to see better, I'm saying it just happens, but because it just happens, we see better. The see, better vision functions in both cases. Uh, in one, it's a goal, and the other, it is a, a result that happens that benefits us, but it's not a goal that we're striving for. And I'm suggesting that that's the right way to think of a whole lot of processes, like uh, Russell uh, uh, trying to catch uh, the tennis ball, that there are a whole lot of processes going on in his brain, but there's no reason why, in addition to all of his intentionality, there has to be a whole lot of computational processes that are in the deep unconscious. Okay, let's take questions about that. What I'm arguing for is where cognitive science is concerned, we ought to take the brain more seriously than we did for a long time. This is, and I've told you, this is happening. We're moving, I mean, as we speak, uh, we're moving from uh, computational cognitive science uh, to uh, cognitive neuroscience. And the amount of people, uh, the amount of money devoted to this is prodigious. Somebody told me that, that as we sit here, there are about 2,000 people working on vision, uh, doing uh, uh, neurobiological research on vision. So there's plenty of work is actually happening. Uh, guess what? It's a lot harder than people thought it was going to be. Francis Crick, I may have told you this story, once said to me, that he found it much harder to solve the problem of consciousness than he had found it to solve the problem of DNA. You know, he and Watson did it in a matter of uh, uh, weeks. 
in uh, Cambridge in the early 1950s, and now he's been working for years and years on how the brain causes consciousness, and he still hadn't come up with a solution. Well, nobody else has either, and it is not an easy question, uh, and we, we may not solve it. Uh, in, well, I think it's quite likely we won't solve it in my lifetime, but I think it's quite likely we will solve it in your lifetime, because we know two things. We know that consciousness exists, and we know that it's caused by brain processes. Now, if you know those two things, then it ought to be possible to figure out how the brain processes actually cause it. Uh, and I, I don't know of any theoretical uh, obstacle to that, though various people claim that there are theoretical obstacles. Okay, so that is my, my suggestion as to how we, ought to rip, how we ought to construe cognitive science as a research project or a set of research projects, and it's happening. I mean, as I think, uh, I, I won't say I'm winning the argument because I don't think a lot of people paid attention to my arguments, but I think something like this is happening simply because we have much better brain research techniques than we used to have. Okay, let's take questions. By the way, is this thing, uh, it's not working right, huh? Okay, what? what? It worked fine? Okay, because it seems to me it's shouting back in my ear, but that's all right. I like to hear myself talk. <laughs> yes? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Here is the picture that I am suggesting. Now, this uh, this is a hypothesis on my part. I haven't demonstrated this to be true, but it uh, uh, meets a whole lot of the conditions that I've set. When you see an object, that's meaningful. Uh, when you when when you're actually visually presented with an object, and when you interpret the experience in such a way that you recognize this as a face of somebody you know. The temptation is to think that in between the initial input, which was meaningful, and the output, which is the recognition, which is also meaningful, there must have been a lot of meaningful processes of inference. That was the whole point about uh, the uh, Ponzo illusion, was that it looks like you've got to be making these inferences in order that you can see the top line as longer than the bottom line, when in fact they're the same length. What I'm suggesting is uh, there's no need to postulate any meaningful inferences. Now your question is, yeah, but how do they get aspectual shape? And the answer is, at that level there is no aspectual shape. There was an aspectual shape when you saw it, you saw these lines, and the aspectual shape is the, the top one looks longer. Does everybody remember the, the VOR, um, the, um, uh, the Ponzo illusion? I'll do an even more incompetent job of drawing it than I have done before. But it's sometimes called a railroad track illusion because you see these lines. Uh, you see the two lines converging toward the top. And then you see these two lines as having different lengths, even though I tried incompetently to draw them with the same length. And you do that so on the standard cognitive science account because you make two inferences. You infer that this is further away, and then you infer that this one is bigger by following Emmert's law. If it's got a name, it must be false. Um, <laughs> Emmert's law says that when you have a stimuli on the visual uh, 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 when you have visual stimuli on the retina uh, that are the same size, the brain will perceive the one that is further away, uh, that is perceived as further away as bigger. If it looks as if it's further away, it will look bigger. Uh, okay, so this is uh, the, the standard intellectual account of the Ponzo illusion, and I'm saying you don't need all that apparatus. It just looks bigger. Why? Well, the brain processes it uh, in a certain way, but there's no reason to suppose that the brain is following any rules that have any intentional content any more than there is in the case of the vestibular ocular reflex. There are a series of processes going on. Meaningful input, meaningful output doesn't follow that there are a whole lot of intentional contents in between. That's the point I'm making. And you ask a deep question, where does it get aspectual shape? And what I'm suggesting is it doesn't. The aspectual shape is this one looks longer 
than that one, even though they're both the same, even though I know independently they're both the same length. That's the whole story about aspectual shape. Now, I, why is it like that? Well, there are all sorts of ways that the brain has of coping with the environment, I, and one of them is perspective. Uh, one of them is uh, that uh, you are able, the brain is able to identify size and shape by perspectival cues, but it doesn't follow that it's making a lot of inferences. Another famous example was the Eames Room. Uh, the Eames Room was originally at Princeton, and the way it worked is this. They had this uh, room that looked sort of like a real room, a door and windows and all the rest of it. The only thing is the room was actually structured like this so that if a guy came in this door, he was so tall that his back he had to bend over. To, I mean, it was like this. Um, he had to bend over like that. Whereas if he came in this door, uh, he looked absolutely tiny. So uh, when a guy comes in the room, it looks like there's a giant in the room if he comes in that door. And if he comes in the other door, it looks like a midget because the room is skewed. Now, why? Well, presumably because we're used to more or less rectangular rooms. So we interpret uh, the guy as bending over. We interpret him as a huge guy in a normal sized room. Now, what, uh, what supports that hypothesis is if it's somebody you know pretty well, like, for example, it's not a guy, but it's your husband, uh, then it, this looks like you're in a goofy room. It doesn't look like your husband suddenly became a giant or a midget. So, why, well, what's going on there? Well, you have a set of uh, experiences with people you know, and so you don't allow the room to trump what you know, whereas in the other case where it's a stranger, you allow your, your habitual expectations about perspective uh, uh, to uh, predominate. Okay, questions about all of that. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that you need to follow Occam's razor. Don't postulate a whole lot of crap you don't need. Don't postulate stuff you don't need, particularly since it doesn't make any sense. That, uh, I have argued that the postulates in the deep unconscious doesn't make sense. Now, here is a fascinating question, and I don't know the answer to it, and it's this. Where is linguistics going to add up? You see, we've now had 54 years of the Chomskyan revolution. The first book was published in 1957, Chomsky's Syntactic Structures, and it was a revolution. In fact, I wrote a, an article that became fairly well known called Chomsky's Revolution in Linguistics, and it did, Chomsky did revolutionize the study of language. The problem is that after 54 years, it's hard to know what the results are. Uh, every few years, they have to have another scientific revolution. They give up on the explanatory apparatus they had. And I really don't know what the uh, current state of play is, but it ought to bother us. This is supposed to be a science like any other. It ought to bother us that there's no set of rules. In fact, as far as I know, there's no single rule uh, that competent linguists are prepared to agree is a rule of uh, grammar of English grammar, uh, much less a rule of universal grammar. So it's still up for grabs, and I think one of the mistakes was to suppose that the way you understand a sentence is by a set of algorithmic rule processes that enable you to parse the sentence. Now you do uh, parse sentences, uh, and it's an interesting question how you do it. I mean, and the Conclusive examples were given by Chomsky early on where you have sentences that are structurally ambiguous. That is, a sentence is ambiguous even though none of the words is ambiguous. Uh, one of my favorites is this. If you take the sentence, I like her cooking, None of those words is ambiguous. I like her cooking. Those all perfectly straightforward English words. I mean, uh, here you've got a uh, morpheme uh, uh, on, 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 ing on the verb cook. 
I, and you got present tense uh, morphemes on like. Uh, but basically, w the structure is pretty visible. Okay, now the sense can mean any number of things. It can mean, I like what she cooks. I like the way she cooks. I like the fact that she cooks. I like her when she's cooking, not otherwise. Uh, but furthermore, it all has a cannibalistic interpretation. I like the fact that she's being cooked. I like the way she's being cooked. I, I, I like her when she's being cooked, etc. You can uh, work out uh, all, your, all the permutations. Now, that's very interesting. That means, if you can recognize, though, that means uh, that this uh, sentence is ambiguous in its structure. I, and another example that Chomsky liked was, flying planes can be dangerous. That can mean either it's dangerous to fly planes, or it can mean uh, planes that are flying can be dangerous. Uh, so it's, uh, the question is, what is the subject of the verb fly? If it's the planes that are flying, uh, then it's the planes that are dangerous. But if uh, planes is the object of the verb fly, someone is flying planes, uh, then uh, the, uh, uh, that the uh, dangerousness now has a different subject from what it had before. I, uh, visiting relatives can be a nuisance. Is the same, uh, exactly the same structural ambiguity. It can mean either re relatives that are visiting can be a nuisance, or it can mean the activity of visiting relatives can be a nuisance to you. Uh, so these sentences are structurally ambiguous, and that's very important because the meaning of the sentence is entirely determined by its structure and the meaning of the parts. By the, we all understand the difference between John loves Mary and Mary loves John. So though they have the same parts, they have different structure. Now what happens, what this shows, what these examples show is that there are structures that are not visible. There are structures that are not on the surface, but there are underlying structures, and you have a knowledge of the underlying structures because you can give these alternative interpretations of a sentence where none of the words is ambiguous. The sentence is ambiguous, but the words are not ambiguous. Okay, now that's a deep point. What's the explanation for it? Well, the explanation was that you're following a lot of rules unconsciously. The difficulty with that is that nobody ever got a satisfactory account of which rules you're following. So that seems to me still up for grabs. I mean, that would satisfy, if you got those rules, uh, I treat this as a subject, treat that as the object. Uh, those would satisfy the connection principle, but it makes me suspicious that we don't have a generative grammar that is generally agreed on. Okay, somebody had his hand up. Did you have your hand up? Yeah. 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 That's yeah. And that seems to me to indicate there is a there's a larger aspect, a contextual aspect that's not just in the book, yeah. but in the culture that the book. No, is. you're absolutely right about that. That the um, I, all interpretation goes on in a context, and I, if, since you've taken this course, you know it goes on against a background. It goes a, uh, a background uh, of assumptions or capacities, practices, uh, about how the world works. So if you have a sense, I like her cooking, you would look at the context to interpret that. But if you have a sense, I like the table cooking, I don't know how to interpret that. I mean, somebody's eating tables nowadays, or they've built tables that will cook for us. I, I, we don't know how to interpret that because it doesn't fit the background. Uh, and you, but you're right that disambiguation takes place against the background. Now, the problem with saying that is it looks like you got an explanation, but you don't because you need to know yes and exactly how does the, I, I, the context work. And that's, well, I'm going to have to at some point, maybe Thursday, give you a lecture on the background because it's the, it is uh, the great unexplained concept in this course. It's the, of the concepts that I've used, intentionality, direction of fit, conditional satisfaction. It is the most 
I, I am unsatisfactory. I'm dissatisfied with my account of the background. And any help you guys can give me, I will appreciate. But we need an account of the background, because it's the background in all of these cases. There's a background, I, a set of capacities. You know, cooking is an activity done by human beings. Um, I, and human beings normally cook food. But if you see a sentence, I saw, I like the table cooking, or I saw the table cooking. You don't know how the hell to interpret that, because tables don't cook, at least not the ones I know, uh, and they don't even get cooked. Now, we, uh, I, you can, a uh, science fiction, imagine a different uh, culture altogether. Tables are made only out of bacon. And what you do is you cook a table. If, you, it's a, if it's a hell of a big breakfast, you cook the whole damn table. Otherwise, you might just cook slices off of the table. OK, so I'll leave you to do science fiction uh, imagination on that. Other questions uh, at this point? Yeah. I describe what is? Yeah, human instinct. Well, the problem with instinct I, is uh, that w too many different things are included under the concept of an instinct. It's like the concept of a reflex. Now, uh, we made some advance. When I took an undergraduate biology course, they told us, in all seriousness, human beings have no instincts. Absolutely crazy. How can any science at any point think that? I mean, uh, leaving aside sex and survival, for example, we have an instinct to walk upright. Very few of us walk around on all fours. Uh, I'd like to know more about the damn wolf children. You know, there's always this anecdotal stuff about the kids brought up by wolves. And maybe they, do they walk on all fours? OK, Jennifer has spoke, even just by nodding her head. That's a speech act. Uh, uh, so, but you can train people uh, to walk on all fours, but instinctively we do it upright. And I think language is an instinct. I think we have an instinct to language. So all kinds of things go under the name instinct. Now, the question is, in the operation of the instinct, is there intentional content? And the answer is typically yes. Uh, the, uh, uh, the organism will try to do something. You know what that means. That's an intention in action. But is the existence of the instinct itself a set of intentional contents? That seems to me much more doubtful. Yes. So take, for example, take a baby yeah. in a pool of water. It knows to relax. Well, it doesn't know to relax at any point, but that's what it does. And that you could argue that that's an instinct. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't have, seem to have any intention behind it, because the baby would be able to realize it would drown otherwise or it's in a pool of water. So yeah, I'm suspicious. I'd want to know more about it. And, 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 and you're not going to do it with my babies, OK? <laughs> So whenever they tell you things like this, you know, it's all right to put babies on a cliff because they have an instinct to not go over the cliff. Well, thanks a lot. Not my child. Um, OK, so I just don't know enough about that to have an intelligent opinion. OK, other questions? Well, all right, now here we are. Can you bear it if I gave a lecture on free will? I dread free will because I don't have anything intelligent to say about it. Anyway, what the hell? I have to do it eventually uh, before. Yeah, uh, before the end of April, I have to give you both a lecture on the background and a lecture on free will. And it's, you know, it's like saying, the, the dentist says, yeah, you're going to need root canal work here. Oh, thanks a lot. OK, here goes, free will. What exactly is the problem of free will? And why do we still have it after, what, 2,500 years of worrying about it? I mean, I'm, uh, uh, to put it modestly, I've solved the mind-body problem. I've refuted artificial intelligence. And I've done a whole lot of other crap. Now, why can't I do it for free will? Well, I can't. Here goes. Here goes with a try. What exactly is the problem of free will? Well, the problem is very simple. It can be put at, like many philosophical problems, in the form of a paradox or of a form of a conflict. On the one hand, we are convinced in our dealings with the world that everything that has happened has a deterministic explanation. Uh, if you want to know why the Cyprus freeway collapsed in Oakland, by the way, that's spelled Cyprus, for those of you who keep. Uh, it's not like the island. The Cyprus freeway in Oakland collapsed. The answer is the collapse was caused by the Loma Prieta earthquake. And that explanation gives a sufficient condition. Given the forces on the freeway, it had to collapse. 
I mean, you, you can't get away with saying, if somebody says, okay, I want you to do an analysis of the collapse of freeway and explain exactly why it collapsed, it won't do to say, well, it's just one of those things, you know? Sometimes things happen, and the freeway just collapsed, just like that. There wasn't any explanation. We don't buy that. You have to have an explanation. Everything that happens has to have an explanation in terms of causally sufficient conditions. Okay, that's one instinct, and that's a very, well, I, I, I'm borrowing your word here. That's one impulse we have to say that. Everything must have an explanation in terms of causally sufficient conditions. But now here's another fact. Whenever we have to make up our minds, we actually have an experience of alternatives being presented to us. We could choose this or we could choose that. And we have a sense that though we're doing this, we could have done that. In the last election, presumably, you voted for a candidate. But you had a sense, yes, I'm voting for this guy. But I could have voted for that guy. I wasn't forced, compelled, or determined to vote for this guy. I had a free choice. So that's the first thing, is that we've got a conflict between the experience of freedom, the experience of making up our mind, and our conviction, indeed our background presupposition, that everything that happens is causally determined by antecedent causes. That the, uh, that the sense in which the causes are sufficient is the sense that given those causes, there's no way it could have turned out otherwise. If I drop this piece of chalk, it's going to fall. And we know that it's going to fall because gravity is acting on it. And in that context, it had to fall. There's no way that it could have turned out otherwise. Yet our experience is of making up our mind where we have the experience we could have done otherwise. Now, I have a name for these experiences. I call them collectively the gap. There's a causal gap between our reflecting on what we're going to do and our actually making up our mind to do it. And the problem of free will it can be stated quite succinctly. The experience of the gap is inconsistent with our conviction uh, that everything is determined. The experience of freedom is inconsistent with our conviction of determinism. Well, you might say, well, what's the big deal? That's absolutely common with uh, all sorts of common sense conviction. Uh, your experience of color is inconsistent uh, with your conviction that, in fact, colors are a systematic illusion uh, caused by the reflection of light uh, striking your perceptual apparatus. Or your experience of the flatness of the Earth in Kansas is inconsistent with your conviction that the Earth is round. So what? You give up on your common sense conviction. It looks flat, but in fact it's round. Uh, and objects look colored, but in fact uh, it's just the uh, effect of light reflectances on our visual system. Now here's a difference between freedom and other illusions. If freedom is an illusion, it's one we can't give up. You can't meaningfully make up your mind except on the presupposition that alternatives are open to you. You can't meaningfully deny freedom of the will in situations where you're actually trying to make up your mind what to do. So imagine that you're in a restaurant and they bring you the menu and it's got a, a choice of the, the veal, uh, the fish, the beef, and if this is Berkeley, vegan, okay? You got, you got a vegetarian uh, uh, stuff on the menu as well. Now you look at all these choices and the waiter comes and says, what would you like? Now what you cannot do is say, I'm a determinist. Que sera, sera. It's an Italian restaurant. Uh, que sera, sera. I'll just wait and see what happens. I'll wait and see what I order. I don't have to make up my mind. Everything is determined anyway. 
Now, why can't you do that? It's a free country. And the answer is the refusal to exercise free choice is only meaningful to you as an exercise of free choice. That is, if you refuse to exercise free choice, I refuse to choose because my choice is determined anyway, that utterance is only meaningful to you if you take it as an exercise of free choice. I have freely chosen not to exercise free choice. You can't shake off the conviction of free choice when you're actually making up your mind. And the attempt to shake it off by saying, well, I don't really have free choice, I, so I won't try to choose. That is itself a free choice. Does everybody see this point? I, and it's hard to get people to see this. I gave a lecture on this once in London. And in the question period, a guy said, yes, but if determinism were proven to be true, absolutely proven to be true, would you accept it? Would you accept the proof? And I said, listen carefully to the question you just asked. The question is, if it were definitely proved that there is no such thing as free, rational decision-making and choice, would you freely and rationally decide and choose to accept that conclusion? That is, there's no way you can ask the question without denying the premise of the question. Now this, you might say, but that's, you know, yeah, uh, that's like any other illusion. I mean, in the Ponzo illusion, the line still looks longer even after you know that it's uh, the same length. No, it's not like other illusions, because you can live your life on the assumption that those lines are the same length. You can live your life on the assumption that color experiences are illusion, but you cannot live your life on the assumption that there's no such thing as free choice because you're constantly put into situations where you have to make a free choice. And even if you refuse to make a free choice in those circumstances, that is itself a free choice, the choice to refuse to make a free choice. Now, number one, this doesn't show that determinism is false. It just shows that it's not like other, free will is not like other illusions, if it's an illusion, because you can't live your life on the assumption that it's an illusion, even if you're intellectually convinced that determinism is true, you are still forced by the logical structure of your own in conscious intentionality to act as if, as if freedom were true, as if the gap were real, because when you're in the gap, when you're in a situation where you have to make up your mind, I, you, cannot ration, you cannot intelligibly assume that you have no power to make up your mind, that you're just in the grip of forces. Notice that the guy who asked me, would you accept it, did not ask what the question would demand, and that is a prediction. Uh, if determinism were shown to be true, would your mouth flap open and affirmative allomorphs come out? Affirmative allomorphs is technical jargon. means, would you say things like, yeah, uh-huh, sure thing, and how, you bet. Those are all, there's high speed, there's high tech linguistics here. Uh, those are called affirmative allomorphs. Uh, at least that would have been in the spirit of the question. But he did not ask me that. He asked, would you accept it? Meaning, would you freely and rationally decide to accept that there's no such, such thing as freedom and rationality? Now, I've been talking about the gap, but in fact, if you look at the phenomenology of it, there are three different gaps. <clears throat> There's the gap where you have to make up your mind. You have a whole lot of reasons for doing something, for voting for a particular candidate, I, and you make up your mind. But you don't sense the decision as determined. You sense a gap. Then once you've made up your mind and you get to the actual choice situation, or the actual situation where you have to act, all the same, you got to do the thing that you decided to do. So you decided to vote for the Democrats, but you get in to the ballot booth, so you have reasons that lead to decision, and there's a gap right here. That's a gap between the reasons and the decision. And then the decision to the onset of the action, and there's another gap. And then if the action is extended, you're trying to swim the English Channel or you're trying to finish your term paper, there's a gap along the way whether or not you're going to keep going. And this is another way of saying that 
human action is not passive like perception. It's not up to me what I see when I hold up my hand in front of my face. There's no such thing as the philosophical problem of the freedom of perception. But there is a problem of the freedom of action because in the case of action, unlike perception, we experience these three gaps. The gap of rational decision making, the gap of initiating an action, and the gap of the continuation of action to completion. Now, strictly speaking, those three are all parts of a single gap, the gap of voluntary intentional action. In any voluntary intentional action, you always have the sense, I'm doing this, but I could be doing something different. I'm raising my right arm, but I could be raising my left arm. Uh, I'm speaking in English, but I could be speaking in French. Oh, God knows if I could still do it anymore, but I have done it anyhow. Um, okay, so you have a sense of alternative courses of action open to you, and that is and that manifests itself in three different cases: in the case where you're making up your mind, in the case where you've decided to do what you've made up your mind to do, and the case uh, where I you started doing something and you've, uh, you've made up your mind to do it, but you then have to continue to, complete, to completion. You have to complete your term paper, or you have to complete swimming uh, across the river. You, you started the act, but you have to carry it out. Now, the question is, are those gaps, or is that single gap, is it real, or is, in fa is it in fact an illusion? Is the whole thing uh, completely determined? Okay, now that's the question. The problem of free will can be, be stated in one uh, sentence, and that is the question is, is it the case that all human actions are preceded by causally sufficient conditions, conditions such that given those causes, the action had to occur? The reason it's a problem is we have the experience of the gap, we have the experience of freedom. That's the problem. Now I'm gonna tell you the standard textbook solutions. They all seem to me bad. Uh, but uh, that won't surprise you. But anyway, I'm going to tell you what the standard solution is. Any questions about what the problem is? Now, why there is a problem about free will? Okay, the standard solution today, uh, the one that I think most philosophers accept, is called compatibilism. And compatibilism says that free will is really compatible with determinism, it's just a linguistic confusion to suppose that they can't both be true. The question whether or not freedom exists is the question not are there uncaused events. Of course there aren't any uncaused events. The question about freedom is the question about certain kinds of causes. Now, there are certain cases where your decision was forced. You were compelled. You were under duress. Let's say you voted for Obama. <clears throat> that was a free choice because nobody compelled you. But if there was a guy holding a gun at your head and he said, vote for Obama or I'll blow your brains out, then it's no longer a free action. Then it is an action that is compelled forced or under duress. So the opposition, the real opposition, is not between freedom and determinism, but between freedom and compulsion. Are there any free actions? There are lots of free actions. Here's one, I just raised my right arm. Nobody forced me to do it. But are, are all actions determined? Of course all actions are determined. This one is determined, for example. I just raised my right arm, but that was completely determined. So the idea, the solution to the problem of free will is to see there's no real conflict between freedom and determinism. The thesis of determinism is the obvious truth that all events have causes and actions are events like any other. So to give an explanation of an action, you simply have to cite the causes. The question whether or not there are free actions is the question whether or not there are certain types of internal rational causes of your actions. And that can be the case, that you have complete freedom for certain kinds of actions, even though they're all determined. I'm freely walking back and forth uh, on this floor. 
I, uh, my, I'm, my freedom is partly restricted by this uh, uh, leash that I've got here. But I'm freely walking back and forth. That's what we mean by a free action. So the question is, are there some actions free? Obviously, this one's free. Is everything determined? Of course, everything is determined. So on this view, freedom is compatible with determinism. Now, one of the reasons people like compatibilism is it seems to rescue something that they want, and that is moral responsibility. In fact, I'm amazed at how many people who write about freedom of the will really don't care about freedom of the will. They're interested in moral responsibility. And compatibilism seems to allow for moral responsibility, even in a world where everything is determined, because it says you're morally responsible where your action is determined by certain internal causes, such as your character, your desires, your inclinations. What they don't want is a result that says, look, you can't hold Hitler morally responsible because everything he did was determined. And, and now they seem to answer that by saying, no, it's true everything was determined, but some things were determined by the fact that he was such a bad guy. And though you can keep moral responsibility and still grant determinism. I, I think moral responsibility is a very confused notion. I'm not going to talk about it, but I think it's one of the things that drives compatibilism. Now, I'm now going to refute compatibilism, but I want you to appreciate the force of it, because the number of big honchos who accepted compatibilism is quite striking. It includes, well, Hobbes and Hume, our famous uh, uh, compatibilist, uh, John Stuart Mill, and then in the 20th century, just about everybody who wrote about this, Charles Stevenson, Donald Davidson, they're all compatibilists. I am not a compatibilist. Tom Nagel is not a compatibilist, but we're a beleaguered minority. I want to tell you what's wrong with compatibilism in a minute. Jennifer had a question. Yeah, so um, compatibilism, psychological determinism is out. You have this freedom yeah. to make the choice, but then you're physically determined. It strikes me that it's both P and not P. It's not answering the question at all. Here's the compatibilist answer. The compatibilist says that all of my bodily movements are completely determined. And let's spell it out. At the time of the Big Bang, 13 billion years ago, it was completely determined that at this moment, in this instant of history, Searle would raise his right arm. I don't know how he's referred to in the book of history, but all the same it has to say at that point he's going to raise his right arm. 13 billion years ago, every muscle movement was determined. Okay, now that we accept, everybody accepts, oh, to accept that. That's determinism. There's always quantum mechanics. I'll get to that in a minute. Oh, okay, but now then the question is, all the same, there's some actions that are determined by certain inner causes. So, for example, I decided to raise my right arm and nobody was uh, forcing me, compelling me, threatening me uh, uh, with a gun or anything of the sort. So the, the conclusion is supposed to be all bodily movements and indeed all events of any kind are completely determined, but some events are human actions, and some of those events are determined by certain inner psychological causes, and those are what we call free actions. When people march in the street with a sign that says freedom now, they don't mean abolish the laws of physics. They just want the government to get off their back or there to be uh, fewer restrictions or something like that. That's what the compatibilist would say, yes. Yeah. So, so what that I decide I'm going to do something, the moment I move my body, it's physically determined. Yes, but so was your decision. Your decision, everything that happens is physically determined. Your decision to move your body, the movement of your body, everything is, is determined. And the, and the decision to move your body is an event like any other, and it's determined. So, so what force is there with compatibilism to say that there's freedom at the psychological yeah. level? What, what, the, what the compatibilist says is free actions are those that are determined by certain kinds of causes. And the causes in this case are that you made up your mind. But was your making up your mind determined? Of course. Everything is determined. But, the, but we're now looking at the use of words. And the, according to the use of words, we call certain actions free not because they're random events, 
uh, but uh, because they're determined by certain kinds of causes. And now the compatibilist goes the next step. Hume goes that. Not only is freedom compatible with determinism, but in fact, freedom requires determinism. For suppose determinism wasn't true, then your actions would be just random. They would be just random things that happened. They wouldn't be your actions at all. It would just be some random events. In order that you should freely have decided to vote for Obama, your action must be determined by such things as your character, your rational processes. So freedom doesn't, isn't just compatible with determinism, it is. But in fact, genuinely free actions require that they be determined. They be de determined by things like your character and your rational thought processes. Okay, now, what's wrong with compatibilism? Well, in one sentence, it doesn't answer the question. Uh, what it says is that there's a use of the word free and determined where an action can be both free and determined. Let's agree with that, that there is such a use. All the same, our question was this. Are there any actions which are such that they're not preceded by causally sufficient conditions? Where given the situation at the time, the agent could have decided to do something different and done something different. Now, I mentioned, I said that without using the words free and determined. Are there any actions where they are not preceded by conditions that are causally sufficient to fix that action? The causes which are such that it follows from a statement of the causes that the action is bound to occur. Any contrary hypothesis is inconsistent. See, given a statement of the forces acting on this piece of chalk, the statement that I released it will logically imply that it falls. And to suppose that it might do otherwise would be logically inconsistent with the statement of the gravitational forces acting on an unsupported body. So the question is, are there any human actions that are not like that? Because that's certainly the, the case for falling bodies, is that they all uh, are determined and determined in a way that I described, their, their behavior follows from a statement of the course of the relevant laws together with a description of the initial conditions. So I want to say, yes, let's give the compatibilists the use of the words. That's not what worried us. What we're worried about is not, is there a use of the word free, where it's okay to say he acted of his own free will, even though it turns out that his behavior was completely determined by inner psychological causes. I, I think there is such a use of the word. I, indeed, as I said, people marching in the streets with signs that carry freedom now, signs that say freedom now, are not uh, claiming Im immunity to the laws of physics. But what we're interested in is granted the universe the way it is now, and granted the use of words the way it is now, is it the case that there are any actions which are such that, in that circumstance, I could have done something differently, consistent with all of the causes being the way they are? Are the causes invariably sufficient to fix one action rather than another? That's the problem. Now, there is a, an, an answer to this that seems uh, to most people, and used to seem to me to be irrelevant, and that's quantum mechanics. <clears throat> If you ask yourself, is there any fragment of the universe, any part of the universe, where we know that determinism is false? Uh, the answer is that at the quantum level, we know that determinism is false because we know that it's impossible in principle to predict all of the future parameters of a particle. You can predict with probability what's likely to happen, but you cannot give deterministic predictions there is an element of randomness in the universe itself. Now, this is an important intellectual revolution, and I want to call your attention to it. Prior to quantum mechanics, the notion of randomness was mostly used epistemically. When you go to Las Vegas, uh, the behavior of all of the dice and the roulette wheels, it's all determined. It's, uh, everything is, is causally determined. But you can't know which way the dice is going to come up. You can't know where the roulette wheel is going to stop. So when we say it's random, we don't say it isn't determined. It's completely determined. The randomness is in our knowledge. We can't know whether or not the coin is going to come up heads or tails. But if I now flip a coin, 
assuming the physics of the coin is determined and assuming the it came up heads uh, assuming I, I, that the uh, forces acting on the coin are standard mechanical forces then it's entirely determined how it was going to turn up it's just reasonable to bet on it uh, because you can't know you can't know in advance so randomness was not a part of the universe it was part of our knowledge of the universe but what happened in quantum mechanics is randomness became part of the universe. It isn't just uh, that uh, we can't know what's going to be what's going to happen next, but there's no fact now to be known. To put it crudely, God couldn't know because there's no fact to be known at the present time. There is no fact about uh, the behavior of the particle to be known. The most you can know now is the probabilities. Okay, now the standard act uh, answer to that is, well, that's right about quantum mechanics. Okay, at this little bitty level, there really are uh, features of the universe that are not determined. But so what? They're random. And freedom is not the same as randomness. You can't rescue the problem of free will by appealing to quantum randomness because freedom is supposed to be not the same as randomness. Just behaving at random can't be the same as behaving with free will. So the problem of quantum mechanics doesn't really solve the problem of free will. Now I think that's a mistake to say that, but that doesn't mean we've rescued free will. I'm going to say more about that. But the, uh, the, the point where we're at now is if you assume that the universe is determined, then it looks like it's very hard, it's impossible uh, to accept free will, and yet we can't deny free will. And that's not an argument for it. It just says it's different from other illusions. If it is an illusion, it's an illusion we can't shake off, we can't give it up, we can't act on the presupposition that it's an illusion. Now, another mistake that people make is they say, well, but the whole point about quantum mechanics is it really just works at the subatomic level. No, that's wrong. The universe is quantum mechanical all the way up and down. It's quantum mechanical all the way through. It isn't just that quantum mechanics is a little corner of the universe. The entire universe is made out of quantum mechanical elements. All right, what happens, though, is that at the higher level, the indeterminacies cancel each other out. So you can treat the flight of the baseball as a completely determined uh, object. You can treat the baseball as determined. You can use Newtonian mechanics on the baseball, even though it's a quantum mechanical object, as is the bat and the air and everything else, because the various indeterminacies will cancel each other out. Spin up and spin down will all cancel each other out at the macro level. But, that's, but theoretically, the baseball could behave in a random and unpredictable level. I, I, in a random and unpredictable way because it is a quantum mechanical object and now we've now had 50 years, well more than 50 years of experience of experiments in quantum mechanics and they all work. I mean they all come out. So it isn't just that quantum mechanics is just about the micro level. Everything is quantum mechanical and that's very important. You see this picture that most philosophers have, it's very hard to shake this picture, is to think if we could go back to the time of the Big Bang and get all of the particles arranged as they were at the time of the Big Bang, then the history of the universe would be exactly the same. You'd have Nietzsche's eternal recurrence. It would be the same damn thing all over again. But what uh, uh, physics, physics doesn't believe that. What physics believe is no, it wouldn't be the same because you'd have quantum indeterminacies throughout. Any, any set of particles would behave differently in diff over uh, different circumstances simply because of quantum indeterminacy. Uh, okay, I think I detect from the heavy breathing uh, that we've run out of time. We'll go on with this and we'll give, well, I will give an inadequate solution to the free will problem on Thursday.